Hey, I'm Dr. Rob. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. I'm coming to today from beautiful Blue Ridge, Georgia. I came up here to speak at a church, and I took the Saturday afternoon because it's just lovely, warm for February for northern Georgia. And I said, I need to get outside, and I need to make an episode of Biblical Genetics. And today's topic is the incredible shrinking human genome. No, the genome itself has not shrunk. The same number of letters as always, but the number of genes has gone down a lot since I started paying attention a couple of decades ago. Uh, we're going to have to get into some theory. We have to go way back in time to the 1800s and then through the 1940s and 1960s, and then modern gene counting methods to see what's happening. But the genome is not what people expected, which makes it interesting and fun to study. It also tells us uh, more about the handiwork of God. God did not make something simple. In fact, he made it um, unlike, uh, at least I, therefore I think most other people, would ever have imagined. I'm going to be heavily referring to a new paper by Amaral et al. titled The Status of the Human Genome Catalog. They're looking at what we now know to be the best estimate of the number of genes, but it is very different than it was even 20 years ago when the human genome was published. Back then, um, they came out with a number of like 23, 24,000 protein coding genes, and that was a shock. Nobody expected that. In fact, there was this thing they called Gene Sweep. It was a, a betting book kept by Edwin Burney, uh, a famous geneticist, and after a, a meeting at Cold Spring Harbor National Labs, I think it was the year 2000, the geneticists of the world started taking a, you know, they're guessing how many genes there were. And they had a book and it was a dollar per bet. And next year it went up to $5. And sometime after that, it went up to $20. So as they got closer and closer and closer to actually releasing the number, it got more expensive to place a bet. They were all wrong. Every single person got it wrong. Remember the old game show, The Price is Right, where they pull people out of the audience and they had, they'd be standing up front and they'd show them something. They had to guess how much that thing cost, and but they couldn't guess over. So the closest person without going over got invited up on the stage to do some game. Well, not a single one of the world's most famous geneticists would have been invited up on stage because they all guessed too high. A woman named Lee Rowan split the pot with three other people. Now, she had the closest guess, but all three of them were too high. But at least they split it between the three people who guessed less than 30,000. Her number was strange. It was 25,947. It's an oddly specific number for a roundabout guess. Well, the number that first came out, the first published numbers from the ensemble group, and they said it was 24,847 genes. So I got a question for you. Why did all of the world's geneticists guess too many? Why did they think the genome must have many, 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 many genes? Hundreds of thousands of genes, most of them. And why does the genome only have 25,000, 24,000? Actually, the latest count, 19,000. Yes, the number of genes has dropped by a huge percentage since the first genome was published in 2001. Because gene counting methods and... Um, double checking to make sure that thing that looks like a gene really does make a protein. Uh, they've done a lot of double checking and the number of genes has gone down to about 19,000. To get at the answer to that question, we're gonna have to go all the way back in time to, I don't know, let's start with Gregor Mendel, the famous uh, monk who's doing studies on pea plants in his monastery garden. He figures out that the white and the purple flowers, the green and the yellow seeds, the wrinkled and the smooth seeds, those traits are inherited independently and combinatorially. So there's something behind it. There's some sort of a gene behind it, and they're different. There's a purple one and a white one, but he didn't know what they were. He had no idea. He didn't even have the word gene. I would have to wait till oh, 1909, I think, is when the word gene was coined. He's working 1860s. A couple decades later, another German scientist looked at a microscope um, in um, a sea urchin eggs, I think it was. I could be wrong about that, but some big egg. He noticed meiosis and crossing over. Oh, meiosis, the, the pairing up of chromosomes and Xing over and then separating the chromosome that exactly corresponds to Mendel's laws. But even after that was realized and, and geneticists are starting to work on genes and fruit flies and looking at you know, white eyes and red eyes and fruit flies and things like that, they still didn't know what the basis of the gene was. In the 1940s, Beadle and Tatum came up with a famous experiment. So they found a series of mutations in the same biochemical pathway, and one mutation deactivated one place in that pathway. So they came up with the 
what's called the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. So there's a thing called a gene. We don't yet know it that it's DNA, but there's a thing called a gene. That gene produces a protein, an enzyme, and that enzyme does one thing. So then in the 1950s, we have um, a Watson and Crick. They figure out the structure of the DNA. In the 1960s, they figure out all the transfer RNAs and how to go from DNA to RNA to protein, translating three letters of the RNA into one amino acid at a time. And we have um, what's called the, um, the central dogma of molecular biology. That is, information only flows from the DNA to the RNA to the protein. Now, that is wrong. I've talked about it on this channel. I've written about it on creation.com. There'll be a link in the show notes. The one gene, one enzyme hypothesis, working with bacteria, where we saw that bacteria, that section there makes a protein. This section makes a protein. That section makes a protein. That directly translated to estimates of the human genome and how many genes we must have. Well, all you do is count up the number of proteins, right? Well, how many proteins do we make? Oh, a couple hundred thousand different proteins. And different cell types, different tissue types, different cell types within a tissue type will make different proteins in a similar cell in a different tissue. Now, there might be similar proteins, but there'll be a part missing. Or they'll be, um, it'll be twice as long. Or it's just kind of strange that similar but different proteins. And what they figured out after the human genome was sequenced uh, during um, the results of something called the ENCODE project, they're the first people who really expanded an idea of alternate splicing, which was one of my earliest biblical genetics episodes, splicing and dicing the human genome. What they figured out was, take a gene, the gene has what are called introns, which are non-coding regions that they spliced out and tossed out, and then the exons, the coding regions, have to be joined together. But given a specific gene, you get a different exons, can be rearranged, scrambled, deleted, and so you can get different versions of genes in a package-like format. That exon or not. Double that exon or not. Now, one thing I said back then, uh, which someone challenged me on recently, I think they're right, uh, but I was basing on older information. I said that the exons can be, from one gene, can be used with the exons from another gene. That's very, very rare. The early indications were that was true, but um, that hasn't been validated. So really, it's exon shuffling within a particular gene. You have about 19,000 protein coding genes that can combinatorially make a few hundred thousand distinct, different, unique proteins. That was not what anyone expected. That is really complicated, which is typical of biology. We take it and we start looking at it. We start to try to figure things out, especially in the you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, everyone was very confident that science was going to solve everything. And if you just had enough mathematical rules, all of biology could just devolve into a, a set of mathematical tables. And that just was not true. Okay, so how do you count up the number of genes? Well, you could actually do it. You could do it manually. You could scan through the DNA and you could look for ATG. That's a start codon for just about every protein in the human genome. ATG. And then from there, you can start looking downstream in three-letter combinations till you find one of the three stop codons. UGA is the, the most famous stop codon. It sticks in my mind because that's the University of Georgia. And since I went to Georgia Tech, I like to say stop UGA. It's, so I can't forget that one. But there's three of them. You can just scan down the DNA until you find a stop codon. Now, there are only 64 codons. If you have three letters, you know, four times four times four, you can have 64 combinations of those three letters. So every... 20 or so codons, you'd expect a stop codon. And that's true in most of the genome. But when you find a gene, you can start with that ATG and start scanning down. And you can go sometimes thousands of letters before you find a stop codon. That's a gene. You can do that. It is definitely possible. Except that we have introns in the middle of most of our genes. When you find an intron, what do you do? How do you know when the intron starts and stops? Well, there's some classic intron exon stop signals. And you can see that, oh, okay, I think that's an intron. Oh, yeah, now I got a bunch of A's, a uh, bunch of stop codons. I keep on going, going, oh, here's where the intron ends. Oh, now I picks up again. So you can do that manually. It's just that you had a 3.1 billion letters in the genome. You don't want to do it manually. So typically, we use computer programs. And the computer programs will go and find genes. And the number of initial genes was higher than now because a lot of those initial genes they found 
were actually RNA genes. They weren't protein coding genes. Yeah, there are a lot of genes in our genome that don't make protein, but they look just like a gene. They have a start, they have a stop, they can have introns, they can be alternately spliced, but all they do is make RNA that's never made into protein. In fact, the um, RNA gene count has, has exploded over the last two decades. There are now more known RNA genes than there are protein coding genes. Because the genome is not a protein computer, it's an RNA computer. Most of the work in the cell is done at the level of RNA. It is not the simplistic si situation that we thought in the past. But there's even more stuff in the genome that's very strange. There are microRNA genes. There are non-coding RNA that don't look like genes, but they do massive amounts of things in the cell. Non-coding RNA is incredibly important. It's controlling the protein output. So what's a gene? Is it the thing that makes protein? Is it a thing that has introns and exons? Is it the thing that looks like a gene that doesn't actually make a protein? Yeah, those are genes too. They just don't make proteins. And what about all the non-coding RNA that has a, a tremendous function in the cell but doesn't even look like a protein coding gene at all? What do you do with the microRNA genes? There's all these other weird things in the genome that's telling us that well, there's fewer genes than we thought because the way it's controlled is not the way we thought. It's not an easy, you have this thing that does that. Oh no, it's you have this thing that does these several things, but under different conditions it will do other things. And there's the other thing that comes in here and causes this thing to turn off or turn on or do something different. And that a thing we're talking about is not even a protein coding gene. No, we are RNA computers not protein computers, and that's really cool. What it means is that our God, the ultimate engineer and the creator, is a lot smarter than us. When he made the genome, he did it in a way that wasn't intuitively obvious because he wanted to make it robust to change, robust to mutation. He wanted to make it with multi-levels of information so he could make it more compact. There's all sorts of engineering principles that apply to the genome. And I'm kind of glad we don't have, I don't know, 150,000, 200,000 genes. Why? Because the mutation target would be too big. That means that any given mutation would have a much higher chance of hitting one of those protein coding genes. And protein coding genes are not as fault tolerant as the RNA in the genome. Even the RNA genes themselves, they can withstand a lot more mutations before they break. So God forethought all this. And he gave us a genome that's really cool and really fascinating, and unlike what a hundred and more years of theorists thought. That's why the genome has shrunk. The number of genes is a lot less than anyone thought. So what do you think about that? Was that interesting? Send me a comment in the notes on your podcast or on YouTube or on one of the other video feeds that this you might find this video on. Thank you for listening. God bless you all to think clearly. When you study science, you should be praising God at the same time because that God is amazing. Thank you also for your financial contributions. If you'd like to contribute to biblical genetics, there'll be some links in the show notes. And there's two different ways. We have buymeacoffee.com and patreon.com. And I'll leave you to figure out uh, what those mean. Just click on something down below.